That was a section from my piece for ensemble of 23 instruments, Hebe. It tells the tale of Zeus's affections for both Hebe and Ganymede, compelling great adjustments in their lives. I'm going to look at the issue of cause and effect in this episode, and in particular several factors that impinge upon any understanding of what causation actually is. I'll consider matters pertaining to causation and epistemology, causation and probability, including Bayesian probability, and causality and function in the social sciences. With my own eyes I saw before us what all men praise as divine. He was born a king, no other, a splendid youth to gaze upon. Gaius never known a second, nor Hebe led such on to heaven's zone. In vain for him they sing the songs, in vain for him they carve the stone. The classical theme of the music has encouraged me to come to the Schloss Belvedere, which is just past the International School and about four kilometres south of the centre of Weimar. The Rococo-style palace was built almost 300 years ago by the Duke of Saxe Weimar, Ernst August, for social functions. I suppose it was a kind of party house. It was also used sometimes as a summer residence by the ducal families, and a lot of attention was paid to the gardens, which I'll explore in this episode like a mythological Zeus forever seeking resolve. They were developed in the English landscape garden style in the 19th century, and there are many delightful corners to consider matters of motivations and explanation. The main Baroque Schloss is now an arts and crafts museum and contains various artefacts popular with 18th century nobility, such as pottery and porcelain and paintings of themselves. The surrounding buildings are used by the Schloss Belvedere Music Gymnasium, which is a boarding school for talented young musicians from the age of about 11. It's only a short walk from where I live and I frequently attend their concerts here. That's to say, the fact that they hold concerts here causes me, given my interest in both music and education, to come here to listen to these concerts. Fundamental to the link between any two things, or any network of objects and events, as Hebe and Ganymede came to understand, is a matter of motivation or underlying causation. After all, it was the music that caused me, or inspired me, or impelled me, to come here to the Belvedere Schloss. And if I'm looking in my inquiry at links between, for instance, the agency of the Olympian gods and their power over mortals, or the natural laws of physics and the nature of its impact upon the world, or the nature of the links that characterise the Weimar identity thesis for that matter, then I need to look more closely at the matter of causal efficacy and explanation. Perhaps I should start by emphasising in metaphorical terms that causation in the natural world seems akin to subatomic particles. That's to say, it's abstract and theoretical. It's an unobservable phenomenon. Consequently, there are many difficulties identifying precisely what's meant by causation. First of all, there's the mechanism itself, as described by classical physics. If an object such as a billiard ball is struck by something else, perhaps another billiard ball, the impact creates equal and opposite forces on each of the objects, as described by Newton's third law of motion. According to the principles underpinning this mechanism, A. Cause precedes effect. B. The force cannot travel faster than the sound of light or contravene any other laws of nature. And C. The mechanism as a whole conforms to the conservation of energy and implies causal determinism. One event necessarily causes the next. But epistemological matters make the identification of causal factors less straightforward. If one of the young trombonists here at the school was to creep up behind me and rasp a loud B-flat and I was to jump in surprise, then I'd be responding subjectively to environmental stimuli. 
But what would be the actual cause? It wouldn't be the sound waves themselves causing the alarm. A B-flat in itself isn't particularly frightening. So is the cause a distributed phenomena related to various contextual factors? But actually, in this case, cognitive science might argue there is only my experience of the stimuli and my response to it. In a sense, perhaps another metaphorical sense, everything happened in my head. Yet if event A, the trombonist rasping a B-flat, causes event B to happen, me jumping in surprise, the occurrence of event B in my head is not the causal relationship itself, it's only the effect. Similarly, event A, which is seen to be the cause, is also an event. Its acting as a cause is incidental to what it is. If I utilise this kind of reductive approach, then the causation becomes reduced entirely to non-causal terms. Identifying causal antecedents, assuming there is such a thing, is made even more difficult by the need to distinguish between genuine causal relationships and accidents. For instance, listening to loud music might cause a person to achieve great heights of pleasure and thereafter, a few years later, make them go deaf. But it would be wrong to say that experiencing great heights of pleasure causes a person to go deaf. However, if I'm not aware of the loud music being a factor, I might easily jump to the wrong conclusion about what's causing any one event. Given the reliance of classical physics upon a mechanistic and necessitarian account of the laws of nature, the same mistaken conclusion might be equally true in empirical accounts of causation. Here's another example. If event A causes event B, then if event A doesn't occur, then event B won't have occurred either. If a conjunction of events A1, A2, A3 causes B, but a conjunction of events A1 and A2 only doesn't lead to B, then to know that A1, A2 and A3 causes B is not to know that A3 causes B. So, for instance, if a conjunction of three events, the trombonist playing a loud B-flat, the trombonist being in the same proximity as me, and me not wearing headphones with loud music playing, which would prevent me hearing the trombone, causes me to jump, but a conjunction of just two events, the trombone playing loudly and in proximity to me, doesn't cause me to jump, then I cannot say that me not wearing headphones with loud music causes me to jump. The park has many meandering paths, just like this inquiry, and fountains and ponds and pavilions and other shady corners again, just like this inquiry. But this is one of my favourite spots. It's a recently renovated grotto, which is just as pleasant today for a visit as it would have been during the era of classical Weimar. It's a beautiful place to reflect upon the fact that causation has other anomalies too. My own son, who doesn't play the trombone, asked me recently if I thought time travel would be possible one day. I asked him whether, if he went back in time, he would make a difference in the past that might change the present. He accepted the point that even if one atom of him went back and made a tidy change, that change would necessarily pan out around the universe and create a very different world to that which exists today, which in turn would mean that most probably he wouldn't be alive today, which furthermore would mean he couldn't go back in time to make the difference in the first place. So his being alive causes time travel to be impossible. This is the same argument that the cosmologists Collins and Hawking used when they explained human existence, not as caused by the state of the cosmos, but the cause of it. They noted that the existence of life was remarkable given the many factors that were required to provide sufficient conditions to allow it. Life comes from complex compounds which come from dying stars, which means life cannot occur until a universe is of the age where the first stars have already died which means the universe could not have existed with less expansive momentum than it has, as it would have collapsed before life formed, and it could not have had more expansive momentum as matter would have been too spread out to form stars in the first place. They argued, using the anthropic principle, which links observations of the universe as an inevitable consequence of the conscious form that observes it, that if life hadn't developed, there would be no conscious life to perceive the remarkable synchronicity of these conditions and factors. Knowledge of the existence of life can only happen if these conditions hold true. Consequently, not only is the existence of human life an effect of the rate of expansion of the universe, but also our being alive caused the rate of expansion of the universe. There's a Russian garden over there, designed for the Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, who was a Russian Tsar's daughter. There's a small maze and hedge theatre. But I've come to the orangery 
also recently renovated to look at some of the exotic plants. I'm not even going to attempt to say anything about causality in biology and ecosystems, given the controversies between empiricists and evangelicals, and between empiricists and empiricists, and given the fact that the nature of causation is made difficult enough by modern physics models, which now postulate the impossibility of quantifying physical states, let alone their causes. Theoretical physicists, whether they're considering the behaviour of subatomic qualia or, in quiet moments, the behaviour of Zeus pursuing his personal motivations, look to probability methodologies for measuring degrees of belief and for formulating conditions for rationally justified belief and any rationalised justified changes of belief. The underlying theoretical models in modern natural science, which William Talbot described as employing the use of the laws of probability as coherence constraints on rational degrees of belief, or degrees of confidence, and the introduction of a role of probabilistic inference are no longer determinate. For instance, quantum states cannot be measured definitively. Theoretical algorithms can only predict the probabilities of measurements. Consequently, it's the notion of these probabilities as an expression of physical systems, rather than just the theories about these physical systems, that's considered important. According to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, physical systems do not have definitive properties. Particles are described as having statistically defined wave function. The function determines the location of the particle, its velocity and other attributes. Most intriguingly, the mathematics shows that the particle cannot be considered to exist in one place only. Its location is defined probabilistically. The particle can be said to coexist in different places at the same time. In a famous thought experiment developed in 1935 by the Viennese physicist and irulophile Erwin Schrödinger, who worked at the University of Jena for a short time, a cat is placed in a box connected to a mechanism governed by radioactive decay, which is indeterminate. The creature's fate is unknown. Given the decay is probabilistic, the cat is shown to be both alive and dead from radiation poisoning at the same time. When an external observer looks to see what's happening with the cat, the unfortunate creature can only be deemed to exist in one of those states, either dead or alive, but not both at the same time. At the moment of observation, the wave function probabilities collapse and a single state of affairs comes into being. Step forward Bayesianism, named after Thomas Bayes, who was an 18th century English statistician. The method ascribed to his name today describes probability in a very different manner to the mathematics of the Schrödinger wave equation. Instead of describing statistical frequencies, it describes belief. If I throw a coin three times and get three heads, I ought to believe the next coin being a head is still 50-50. To believe anything other is to fall for the gambler's paradox. Indeed, casinos work out the likelihood of a gamer winning by means of standard mathematical frequency probability. They determine what their profit margin will be by controlling the odds and the statistical likelihood of average winnings. But Bayesianism describes probability in a very different way, as subjective belief. After three heads, I might speculate if the coin really is fair, or perhaps whether, for some unknown reason, I'm in the middle of a singularity event equivalent to the formation of a black hole, and therefore I'm justified in believing the next throw is more likely to be a head than a tail. Or perhaps I believe, for the same reasons, the next throw is more likely to be a tail. Bayesianism is not going to work in standard mechanical systems, such as a casino, but it provides a new way of applying subject-based causal factors to an understanding of quantum mechanics. Quantum Bayesianism, or Cubeism, aims to provide a formal expression for the probabilities associated with wave function superposition. However, this wave function is not to be considered an objective phenomenon. It's best perceived as a subjective tool that enables observer to make decisions about the quantum world. The observer subjectively assigns a wave function associated with his or her perspective to a quantum state. Another observer would assign a different wave function. Each individual quantum state has as many different wave functions as there are observers. Hans Christian von Bayer wrote about this in Scientific American magazine recently. He said, By interpreting the wave function as a subjective belief and subject to revision by the rules of Bayesian statistics, the mysterious paradoxes of quantum mechanics vanish. 
But actually, the mystery doesn't seem to vanish at all. The notion of an individual's subjective mental states defining the location and velocity of particles seems reminiscent of the solipsism of Fichte's subjective idealism. But actually, QBism allows for considerations of what might happen when several observers perceive an event or a quantum particle in a collective way. It implies that the metaphysical reality of a mind-independent world is idealist and governed materially by some form of shared consciousness. Actually, Schrödinger wrote on this issue too, in addition to his work on quantum mechanics. He suggested that the consciousness of any individual was a manifestation of some kind of unitary consciousness pervading the universe. I'll look at the long tradition of panpsychism later. If matters of causation have become indeterminate in the natural sciences, then the social sciences have been left with theoretical models of barely more efficacy than their mythological forebears. But rather than reviving Zeus and Hebe in a literal sense, there's been a focus on looking to evolutionary biology for models. One of these is that social processes must have an underlying function. Physical and psychological traits have been shown to have evolved to support fitness, to support individuals surviving and breeding the next generation. And accordingly, social science assumes that social systems must have been fashioned by society for a similar function, or some function at least. Ways of life are not arbitrary. Music tastes, including a predilection for rasping trombone B-flats, have been caused by something fundamental. They've developed the way they have in order to do something. However, this approach causes further difficulties. It makes assumptions about the relations of different levels of system models. It assumes a reductive relation between social structures and biological systems, between mind and nature, which I've addressed before and will return to later. This problem applies to all social studies research, including the sociology of music, and also the grand duke of all social science, economics. Economic theories describe causal factors involved in producing economic phenomenon. For instance, they might talk about the selfish pursuit of maximum wealth. However, such theories can only ever be speculative. The empirical testing of any theory can only ever capture a limited portion of the multiplicity of causes affecting any particular outcome and cannot begin to defend the nature of these causes in and of themselves. However, for all of these problems, in practical terms, identifying cause and effect can be very useful. If you're Hebe or Ganymede, it might help to know of Zeus's motivations. And in terms of modern-day application, the development of new drugs by way of empirical tests relies upon the notion of causation and the existence of systematic relationships between causation and other issues. Perhaps it could be said that, even if we can't know whether a model is able to offer a true account of the real world, its application to economics or music or even cat care still has instrumental use. If it works dependably, then it's of use. Perhaps it could be said that causal theories describe tendencies towards outcomes rather than absolute constancies. They generalise relations. To take a semantic approach, theoretical statements are not to be taken as merely true or false, but are to be considered descriptions of abstract entities. Even if they don't provide exactitude, they offer insight into a situation. And so it goes with all art and music, and museums concerning past historical and mythological eras. I'll finish with another section from the prologue to my piece Hebe. Thanks for listening.